All right, so let's talk about some of the types of lipids that we find in membranes. And this chart, um, I also have you kind of repeat some of this chart to help you study on a lipid uh, diagram that you have on Canvas. The big thing I want you to realize is that in general biology, we learn about phospholipids. Right? And we usually draw them with their polar head and their two fatty acid tails. And that general diagram can work for all of these different types of lipids on this chart as well. I just want you to understand what some of the names mean. Right? So when we talk about the phospholipids, we're saying that it has a phosphate, this choline phosphate as the polar head. But phospholipids can come in two varieties. You can have phosphoglycerolipids or phosphosphingolipids. And the difference really is, is that the phosphoglycerolipids, which is what we learned about in General Biology 1, have this glycerol backbone and two fatty acid tails attached to it. Whereas sphingolipids have this sphingosine molecule as the backbone. And what I want you to understand is this is also a fatty acid tail. It's just already part of the sphingosine molecule. And then another, a second fatty acid tail whoops, is added. So you still have a polar head and two fatty acid tails. There are also glycolipids, and you know that glyco means sugar, and in this case, galactose. So the polar head for glycolipids is galactose. The fatty acid is either a glycoglycerol lipid or a glyco sphingolipid. But still, all have two fatty acid chains that are hydrophobic and all have a polar or hydrophilic head. The other lipid that is a main component of membranes are the sterols. And for animal cells, we focus on cholesterol. And we're going to talk about the importance of cholesterol in keeping membranes fluid or in some cases, not too fluid. Right? But you have different types, and these are important in fungus and plants and the hopanoids in um, prokaryotes. So membranes are composed of different types of lipids as well as the proteins. And based on the type of lipids, you can have variation in the membrane thickness. So most membranes are between 6 to 8 nanometers, really small, really thin, but the thickness can depend on the type of lipid or it can depend on the degree, degree, ah, degree of unsaturation, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. So I want you to see that if you draw your phospholipid with long, straight <coughs> fatty acid tails, it's going to take up more room than fatty acid tails that are kinked up, right? Makes sense. If you have curly hair, it's a certain length. If you straighten it, it's a lot longer and vice versa. This becomes important when we talk about membrane fluidity. So we've talked about the fluid mosaic model. You want to have things able to move around in your membrane. You don't want your membrane too liquidy. You don't want it too solid, right? So just think of making jello, right? You hit that sweet point. For us, we want jello to be pretty rigid. But for membranes, we want it somewhere between the liquid state and the more rigid state because we want these membranes and lipids to be able to 
move around, make lipographs, um, respond to the environment. So when we're talking about lipids, we really are talking about the fatty acid tails, right? And the first number is the number of carbons, right? So you can see, C, 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 okay? So there's, palmate has 16 carbons. And the zero is the number of carbon-carbon double bonds. So um, palmitate, sorry, I didn't say that right, has no double bonds. And so that actually makes this nice straight fatty acid tail. Stearate is slightly different. It's a little bit longer. It has 18 carbons. No double bonds, so it is also a nice straight fatty acid tail. Oleate, on the other hand, has one carbon carbon double bond. Once you have a carbon carbon double bond, it puts a kink in the fatty acid chain. That means that something with kinks are going to take up more space than fatty acids with these long, oh, sorry, straight carbon chains. These guys are called saturated because they have the maximum number of hydrogen bonds or you can remember it as only carbon carbon single bonds. These are unsaturated. They have lost some hydrogens due to these carbon-carbon double bonds. So linoleate has two carbon-carbon double bonds. It has two, sorry, two kinks to it. And you've heard probably if you've looked at things unsaturated and saturated fat, so that's what it means. Do we have the max number of hydrogens, or do we have some carbon-carbon double bonds? And the saturation levels affect membrane fluidity. And there's a nice, I think it's about an eight-minute Khan Academy um, video that talks about all these concepts we're going to cover right now on cell membrane fluidity. So what I want you to understand is that the more unsaturation, the more carbon-carbon double bonds, the more fluid a membrane will be. Because these guys are taking up space, so you can't pack them as tightly. These are like oils. Oils are liquid at room temperature because they have a lot of unsaturated fats. Whereas butter and margarine is full of saturated fats, they are less fluid. They can pack tighter together. That kind of makes sense. Membrane fluidity can be affected by temperature. So you know that you can melt butter, right? So if you increase the temperature, you're going to increase the fluidity. One of the reasons we have homeostasis for our internal temperature is that our molecules would start breaking down if we increased the temperature too much. Likewise, if you decrease the temperature, you get less fluid, or we call it more gel-like. And there are actually some fish that live in the very cold waters, like in the Antarctic, that have um, some special things, uh, some special molecules in their membranes that allow them not to basically freeze. And we have isolated um, those molecules and we put them in things like ice cream so that we can keep our ice cream cold, but it doesn't become solid. So membrane fluidity can be 
affected by the saturation levels. It can be affected by the temperature. And the amount of cholesterol or sterols, if you're looking at plants or bacteria, can also affect membrane fluidity. We'll talk about TM in a minute, but what I want you to understand is that cholesterol takes up space, right? So when we shove cholesterol into our membranes, they can't pack as tightly. But what's interesting is the effect of cholesterol is dependent upon the temperature. Okay. So below this transition point, cholesterol, so at low temperatures, low temperatures, if you add cholesterol, you increase fluidity. So it doesn't allow those um, fatty acids to pack so tight and become the solid jello or gel. It keeps the membrane fluid. At temperatures above, so higher temperatures, cholesterol actually decreases fluidity. So it actually stabilizes. So you've got all these fatty acid tails moving around and you shove more cholesterol in there and it actually stabilizes. So cholesterol affects membrane fluidity, it just depends on the temperature. And that TM is what we call the transition temperature. And this is something that scientists measure. This is basically the phase change temperature, where a membrane will become more solid, and not solid like a desk, but more gel-like, or more fluid. And so membranes, based on their components, will have different ideal TMs where they're at that nice balance and things can move around and the fluid mosaic model works beautifully. Degree of saturation can affect the transition temperature. So as a membrane increases the amount of saturation, the amount of carbon-carbon double bonds, its temperature, its transition temperature, decreases. So that means it's more fluid, less saturated, just the opposite. Well, let's take a look at this. Another figure from your book, which is really important for you to understand this concept, is this is showing you the effect of chain length on the melting point or the transition temperature, and this is the effect of unsaturation. And what I want you to see is that as you increase the length, right, length of those fatty acids, it gets less fluid. Your membrane is less fluid because things are packing tighter together. Whereas, I didn't draw very good, do this very good. Shorter tails, whoops, will leave a little bit more space and make it a little more fluid. And you can see these like about 10 degree increases as you increase the number of carbons by two. What's very striking is this graph in the red here. There's a huge impact in the number of double bonds. Just going from zero to one double bond decreases that te transition temperature by about 50 degrees, right? That means if you have double bonds, you're much more fluid. And then as you increase the number of double bonds, the membrane gets more and more fluid. So you have a homework problem that allows you to kind of think about this concept and do some analysis. The last thing I want to, well, just about the last thing, is the effect of detergents on membranes. So hopefully in general biology you learned that a detergent is something we call amphipathic.
which means it has both a polar and a nonpolar region. Okay. And that's just like a phospholipid, right? A polar head and a nonpolar tail. In general biology, we usually talk about detergents solubilizing lipids, right? So when you have that um, greasy mess left in the bottom of the pan after dinner, you add some detergent and it starts to break up the lipids. And what's really happening is this detergent is surrounding that little lipid molecule. And detergents do the same thing to membranes. They start to break down or disrupt the membrane. So if you do a lot of dishes with detergent, your hands sometimes get dried out because they're disrupting the membranes and they're um, removing some of that natural oil on your skin. We use detergents in biology to break down membranes to isolate the different components. So here's a membrane with two proteins. And as the membrane falls apart and becomes part of this detergent balls, right, the proteins are separated from the detergent, I'm um, sorry, from the membrane. And the detergents will actually surround the proteins and kind of protect them. And eventually the detergent will actually denature or make the protein fall apart. This concept is really important for SDS page. And again, I talk about techniques in a different set of lecture videos. But SDS is a type of detergent. And so one of the ways we get membrane, uh, I'm sorry, proteins away from the membranes, if you're going to study a protein that's inside a cell or part of a cell membrane, is to mix it with detergent. Right? And then we can wash away the membrane components and we can analyze the proteins. Finally, last little bit about membranes is something called a liposome. Some people call it liposome. And this just means a 3D sphere of lipids. And you can see that these look like phospholipids. So when you actually put a bunch of lipids, phospholipids, um, in water, they'll spontaneously form this um, liposome. Right? So you're going to have water here, you're going to have water here. It's kind of like a fake little cell. And liposomes are really good for studying membranes. They're like an artificial membrane. Uh, I don't know. And so we can actually, one by one, add protein components into this liposome and study transport across the membranes or study interactions between proteins. Um, so liposomes are used to study membrane dynamics, how things move. You could study um, saturation effects or cholesterol effects or temperature effects on membrane fluidity. Again, you can study transport like we'll talk about in chapter 8. And liposomes are one of the ways they're looking at delivering drugs. So instead of water in here, you would put your drug. And because a liposome looks like a membrane, here's your cell. That liposome can actually bind to the membrane and deliver the drug inside. This is an example of something called um, endocytosis that we'll talk about um, at the end of chapter 12. So, membranes are made of lipids and proteins. I want you to understand the different types of lipids, the different types of proteins, um, understand what affects membrane fluidity, understand some of the big concepts and um, terms that describe membranes.
because in chapter 8 we're going to talk about moving things across the membranes. So transport, which is essential for maintaining cellular function. Alright, thanks. Ooh.